Good morning, everyone. I'm Christine Radarski. I'm the Rochester City Historian and the manager of the Local History and Genealogy Division at the Central Library of Rochester in Monroe County. We're delighted to welcome you here today for the first session in 2021 of our popular Morning in the Morning presentation series, which is presented in partnership with the Friends of the Mount Hope Cemetery. Today, we have the president of the cemetery us to present. Pat Corcoran is a retired city school district teacher and she has been researching Rochester's Lillian Wald and she'll tell you why we claim her as Rochester's. And uh, she'll be talking to us about this. She's been researching Lillian Wald for many years now and so is considered the area's expert on Lillian Wald. So we are delighted to have Pat with us today. Please um, if you have questions during the session, please feel free to type them into the chat and I will track those for Pat to answer at the end of the session. Please keep the chatter um, unrelated to the program to the minimum and we will be opening it up for a live questions at the end of the session as well. So Pat, welcome. Good, good morning, friends. During this time when many of us are isolated and unable to interact with our families and our friends, I invite you to enter the world of Lillian Wald and through her own words, learn of her passions, her strengths, her struggles, her accomplishments, and her legacy. I hope that this celebration of Lillian Wald's life will inspire you and fill you with confidence in our futures as Americans. <clears throat> Let's start. Nurse, social worker, child advocate, feminist, suffragist, trade unionist, pacifist, anti-militarist, immigrant rights advocate, founder of Visiting Nurse Service of New York, founder of Henry Street Settlement. How is it possible that one woman could accomplish so much in 73 years? <clears throat> Miss Wall was a woman with many titles. Lady Light, Fair Lady of Miracles, She Who Must Be Obeyed, a Damn Nurse Troublemaker, Miss Liberty of the Lower East Side, Sister Mother Henry. Her favorite title, however, was Head Resident, Henry Street Settlement. Lillian Wald was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, the third of four children. Her parents were immigrants. Her mother had come from Germany and her father from Poland. Both had come as children. Their ancestors were rabbis, professionals, merchants, and successful businessmen in Europe. In 1849, these families decided to leave their affluent life in Europe and come to America because they feared religious persecution. They settled in Cincinnati, the center of reform Judaism. Lillian's father, that's a gentleman on the right, eventually grew up and started an optical business. He married Minnie Schwartz when she was only 16 years old. Max was a quiet, erudite man, while Minnie was the energetic, beautiful center of the family. Minnie's father and brother were constantly at their home. Lillian's life revolved around this family. Her grandfather was like a surrogate father. That's him on the left. He was lovingly called Favy. He recited German legends, Bible stories, and Shakespeare. He bought the children ponies. He brought a German theatrical company to town so that the children could hear stories in German. And he built the children a playhouse modeled after a typical cottage in rural Germany. Lillian was a bright, energetic child who loved books and drama. Her mother was convinced she would become a writer. Her best friend, however, was her brother, Alfred. Alfred ex excelled in so many areas that his family had high hopes for him. Alfred wrote a newspaper with 
Lillian, and together they put on theatrical productions. Lillian dreamed that Alfred would become a doctor someday and she would be his assistant. In 1878, the family moved to Rochester where they had many relatives. All of her Rochester family was in the clothing business. Her uncles, Henry and Morris Schwartz, had one of Rochester's earliest and most successful clothing firms. Lillian's family moved into a lovely home on East Avenue and relocated later to a home on South Union Street next to her uncle Henry's family. Lillian was raised in a liberal religious atmosphere and attended Miss Crittenden's school, having been referred there by Dr. Max Landsberg, head of the local Reformed Jewish Temple. Miss Crittenden's English and French School for Young Ladies and Little Girls produced disciplined young women prepared for college. In the 1880s, parents were not really interested in girls attending college, however. People thought of this school as good preparation for finding a good husband. Lillian was stunningly beautiful, popular, and had lots of male suitors. She applied to go to Vassar at the age of 16 and was rejected because of her age. And she continued studying at Miss Crittenden's school. In 1885, tragedy struck the Wald family. At the age of 25, Lillian's brother Alfred drowned. Lillian's mother became bedridden in her grief. For two years, Lillian ministered to her mother and got a job as a clerk just to get her mind off of this terrible tragedy. In May 19, 1888, Lillian's older sister married Charles Barry, son of the wealthy Irish Barry family of Elwanger and Barry fame. They built a beautiful Georgian home on East Avenue. Many dreamed that Lillian would follow in her sister's footsteps and find a worthy suitor. Now, interestingly enough, during this time, Lillian did not come in contact with the poor. She was oblivious to the drama of poverty unfolding in the other side of town. When she was 18 years old, for example, 16-year-old Emma Goldman was working in a clothing factory in Rochester, 10 and a half hours a day, six days a week for $2.50. She called Rochester Flower City for the Rich. Lillian was also oblivious to the crusades of Susan B. Anthony, who lived nearby. At the age of 22, Lillian moved in with her sister, Julia. Julia was pregnant and in poor health. The family hired a nurse and Lillian became cat captivated with this nurse and her work. She decided to pursue a career in nursing and applied to the New York School of Nursing in New York City. On her application, she wrote, I have many social ties in Rochester, which might interfere with earnest uninterrupted work there. I've had the advantages of what might be called a good education, knowing Latin and being able to speak both French and German. My life hitherto has been a type of modern American young womanhood, days devoted to society, study and housekeeping duties such as practical mothers consider essential of a daughter's education. But this does not satisfy me now. I feel the need of serious, definite work. I have chose nursing because I feel a natural aptitude for it and because it has for years appeared to be womenly, congenial work, work that I love and which I think I could do. So Lillian graduated in March, 1891 and in May, her father died. She returned to Rochester to care for her mother sell their home and move her mother into her sister's home. In August, she returned to New York City to work in the juvenile asylum. This was a very traumatic experience for Lillian and she only lasted one year. She applied to the Women's Medical College, a medical school started by Elizabeth Blackwell 
and set off to become a doctor. During this course of study, she volunteered to teach home care and hygiene to immigrant women on Henry Street. This course was sponsored by Betty Loeb, a well-known philanthropist. It was during this internship on Henry Street that she experienced her baptism of fire. Okay. Uh, I want to read to you in Lillian's own words, what was the experience that changed her life? Okay. And this is from her book, The House on Henry Street. A sick woman in a squalid rear tenement, so wretched and so pitiful that in all the years since I have not seen anything more tragic, determined me within half an hour to live on the east side. From the schoolroom where I had been giving a lesson in bed making, a little girl led me one drizzling March morning. She had told me of her sick mother and gathering from her incoherent account that a child had been born, I caught up the paraphernalia of the bed making lesson and carried it with me. The child led me over broken roadways, over dirty mattresses and heaps of refuse, between tall reeking houses whose laden fire escapes bulge with household goods of every description. She led me on through a tenement hallway across a court, up into a rear tenement, and finally into the sick room. All the maladjustments of our social and economic relations seemed epitomized in this brief German journey and what was found at the end of it. The family to which the child led me was neither vicious nor criminal. Although the family of seven shared their two rooms with boarders who were literally boarders since a piece of timber was placed over the floor for them to sleep on and although the sick woman lay on a wretched, unclean bed, soiled with a hemorrhage two days old, they were not degraded human beings judged by any measure of moral value. In fact, it was very plain that they were sensitive to their condition. And when at the end of my ministrations came, they kissed my hands. It would have been some solace if by any conviction of the moral unworthiness of the family, I could have defended myself as a part of a society which permitted such conditions to exist. Indeed, my subsequent acquaintance with them revealed the fact that miserable as their state was, they were not without ideals for the family life and for society of which they were so unloved and unlovingly apart. That morning's experience was the baptism of fire. <laughs> Deserted were the laboratory and the academic work of the college. I never returned to them. On my way from the sick room to my comfortable student quarters, my mind was intent on my own responsibility. To my inexperience, it seemed certain that conditions such as these were allowed because people did not know. And for me, there was a challenge to know and to tell. When early morning found me still awake, my naive conviction remained that if people knew things, things missing implied in the condition of this family, such horrors would cease to exist. And I rejoiced that I had had a training in the care of the sick that in itself would give me an organic relationship to the neighborhood in which this awakening had come. So it was that Lillian's life changed. And this is one of her famous quotes of what she learned from that experience. Nursing is love in action and there is no finer manifestation of it than the care and poor of the disabled in their own homes. So what Lillian did now that she'd left medical school was to get a friend, Mary Brewster, and go to Henry Street 
first of all, rooming with a college settlement group of girls. And then finally getting their own apartment in a tenement house. The way that uh, they were advised to support themselves was to go back to Betty Loeb, who had sponsored their original Sabbath school, and see if she would support their work on Henry Street. So um, they visited Betty Loeb, L Lillian did, and then Betty Loeb reports that, quote, I have seen, I have had a wonderful experience. I talked to a young woman who was either crazy or a genius. And this was her first response to Lillian, who went and asked her to support this project on Henry Street. So Betty Loeb decided to give um, these two women $120 a month for living expenses and nursing supplies. They lived in this uh, tenement where everyone was um, a recent immigrant. And uh, she writes that we were both quite ignorant but we did know that we cared for these neighbors. During this time, she also met Betty Loeb's brother-in-law, Jacob Schiff, a great fin uh, financier, banker and philanthropist in uh, New York City. And she was able to convince him to give her the Henry Street settlement. He believed in her mission. And so that's when she got a group of nurses and moved into the Henry Street settlement in 1895. Now these uh, young nurses would come from all over and actually live in this building. Here's a picture of some of the first group. The principles of living in um, Henry Street Settlement that Lillian established were as follows. The Henry Street Settlement was to be independent and non-sectarian. A basic tenet in a democracy was that a poor patient has as much right as a wealthy one to call a nurse. And this right existed regardless of racial, religious or ethnic origin. Number two, it would be headed and administered by the nurses themselves. And number three, the nurses would live in the districts in which they worked. In this case, the nurses lived in the Henry Street settlement. Every morning they would meet over breakfast, discuss the news, and then um, they would be sent out to um, various, to visit various patients. Uh, Rose Cohen describes her first encounter with Miss Wald in her book, Out of the Shadows. I opened my eyes and saw a woman, a stranger sitting beside the couch. Neither in looks nor in dress had I ever seen one like this. She was beautiful and distinguished. How do you feel, she asked me. Her lips smiled, but her eyes were sad. She spoke to my mother in German, gave her a card and went away. I spelled out the printed name on the card. Lillian D. Weld, 265 Henry Street. Lillian called the kind of nurse, nursing that they were doing public health nursing. In those days, Student nurses worked in hospitals and other nurses did private care nursing with families. So public health nursing was something new and she coined this phrase in 1893. By 1912, Walt helped found the National Organization for, of Public Health Nursing, which would send, set professional standards. She served as its first president. <clears throat> In this um, flyer, you see that she's 
trying to get nurses to come to New York and to become public health nurses. And um, she's also encouraging in other flyers, she's raising money. But this was a new kind of nursing and it was attractive to many young girls that wanted adventure and wanted a chance to uh, be part of this exciting new Henry Street settlement. The nursing part of the Henry Street settlement became the visiting nurse service. And here is a flyer where she's advertising for money because every new nurse that she had to hire, she had to raise money. So raising money was a huge part of Lillian's job at this time. There was no government money available. The Henry Street settlement became part of the settlement movement that had started in England and had come to the United States. And in um, this picture, they're having their national um, Federation of Settlements meeting in White Plains. The person with the white blouse in the front is Lillian and behind her uh, with her hand on her shoulder is Jane Adams. Now the, I, they were called settlement houses because people lived in the area where they worked. They lived in close proximity to the people that were called neighbors, not clients. Neighbors, because neighbors has a very po positive connotation, people that are friendly, where clients means people that are in trouble. That was their idea. <clears throat> These were the first uh, nurses that were in her Henry Street family. Several of them became very famous in their own right. Certain, certainly um, Lavinia Doc, who we'll be talking about. Um, she's right here next to Lillian and also um, Isabella Waters. <clears throat> Not only were nurses living at Henry Street, many other people came to stay at Henry Street. And they weren't all nurses. Now we see an expansion in Henry Street. Of course, Jane Adams was a close friend of Lillian and they would visit each other's settlement houses often. Um, Lavinia Dock, the nurse extraordinaire, she wrote the nursing textbooks of the time. She was a translator, a concert pianist and a suffragist. And, all, and she stayed for over 20 years at the Henry Street Settlement. Also a person that came and stayed for a long time was Florence Kelly, who was famous in her own right as a translator of uh, the works of Karl Marx. She was an, an attorney. She graduated from Cornell and she wrote a book called Our, to Our Toiling, Toiling Children and was very interested in child labor. And um, so the work that they did involving child labor was led by uh, Francis Kelly, Florence Kelly. Now inside the uh, Henry Street settlement, of course there were classrooms because the people in this neighborhood were immigrants and many of them had to learn English. So we had many German and Russian immigrants initially then Irish and uh, then Italian immigrants in the time that I'll be talking about. Lillian uh, was very interested in the arts. She believed that the arts were an essential part of education and Henry Street Settlement provided workshops, studios, festivals and plays, music lessons and concerts. She encouraged ethnic um, celebrations where people could share their cultures through music, dance, and drama. And this lovely playhouse was a gift from two sisters who were quite wealthy young women that came and taught drama at Henry Street and then eventually their family paid for this playhouse. <clears throat> the contributions that Lillian made um, 
are so interesting to us today, the ideas that she had. One was a fresh air program. Now we've all heard about fresh air programs, but it was Lillian Wall that started the idea that children needed to have experiences in the country. She acquired property in the Catskills and Connecticut. And most of the time it was wealthy people that would give their properties, their summer properties to her to use for her fresh air program. This is one of the flyers that's asking for money to pay for this. Charles Gutman was an eight year old boy when he lived on Henry Street. In adulthood, he contributed $500,000 to the Henry Street settlement and explained the reasons for his gift. Quote, the Henry Street settlement house took me and a lot of Irish and Italian kids and sent us off to the country. You can't explain what a thrill it was. I'll never forget it and there's no way I can really pay them back. I never knew what a cow was Sure, I knew what grass was. We had plenty of that in those days, but a cow, no, sir. This contribution doesn't even the score, but at least it serves to mark an experience that helped open a poor boy's eyes to the possibilities of life in America. Who could believe that Lillian Wald would introduce playgrounds to New York City you know, when she uh, received this home, this uh, Henry Street settlement, she was excited that there was a small lot next door. And so she talked to two of her neighbors and was able to get their backyards, put them together with hers and establish a playground. She became, because she was very interested in playgrounds, she became an active member of the Outdoor Recreation League in New York City that focused on the need for public parks and playgrounds. Uh, this was so important because the children up to this time were playing on the street. <clears throat> this playground was so popular that they had to have a schedule of what people could use it each day. She would have times when mothers and children, she would, could come. She would have time for young people when they got out of work at night, that would be their time. Um, and she had time when little children could come and play. Now, if you had a baby with you when you were a little child, you could get in the front of the line to get into the playground. So, uh, Children, there were hammocks put out and in the bottom picture, you'll see one of the hammocks so that you could bring your little baby brother and put the baby in the hammock. And if you were unfortunate and didn't have any babies in your household, you might go next door to your neighbors and try to borrow a baby because the rule was that if you had a baby, you got into the playground first. Now, raising money was a constant concern for Miss Wald because she didn't get any government help. And it was through her interaction with philanthropists in New York that she was able to raise money. She was very, very clever at raising money. She was so enthusiastic that she became a talented fundraiser. The uh, story was that it cost $5,000 to sit next to her at dinner because she could shake anyone down. Her main philanthropists were Jewish philanthropists at first, people like Jacob Schiff. Of course, while he did support uh, her efforts, he had a lot of rules for her. Like every day at the beginning, she had to write down all the people that she'd visited, all the work that she'd done and send it to him. That lasted a short time, however, and then it was like once a week she had to write a report. And then eventually, of course, that wasn't necessary. They became very close friends. Uh, Lillian relied on Shift to help bridge her gap of religious knowledge and observance between herself and her clients. Shift would remind her, for example, when the Jewish holidays were. Uh, 
once she was about to give a speech on women's suffrage and she called him and asked him for quotes from the Talmud or quotes from your lore, L-O-R-E, acknowledging her lack of Jewish education. I can imagine his face when she used the word lore. Um, they, they always got together, uh, seemed to get together, get along very well. However, at one point, uh, Lillian had put Christmas trees in the kindergarten at Henry Street. And um, Mr. Shift, uh, he objected to that because he said some of the children were Jewish and they wouldn't understand. So uh, that became one of the few times that they disagreed, but Lillian removed the Christmas trees and for many years never had Christmas trees. So um, it was very difficult to uh, always have to listen to what your benefactors wanted. In 1909, in uh, the settlement's guest book, Jacob Schiff writes, I have been as proud, never been as happy concerning anything in my life than the cooperation it has been my good fortune and privilege to render self-sacrificing constructive work done in the Hen Henry Street settlement under the intelligent and efficient guidance of Miss Lillian Wald. God bless her. <clears throat> Lillian Wald recognized that getting programs in public schools would help the, the, her neighbors, her, the people that she worked with. And she was very smart to do this and says that the state recognizes its responsibility for the development of citizens. To meet this responsibility, the school is its most efficient agency. Think about special ed classes, how unusual that would have been in those days because children that had special needs were not allowed to go to school and just hung out in the streets. So in 1900, she convinced the New York City Board of Education to hire Elizabeth Farrell, a Henry Street resident, to teach special education for children with learning disabilities and physical handicaps. Wald's enthusiasm for this project, in her own words, came from a deep line principle that every human being merits respectful consideration of his rights and his personality. This was such a successful program that eventually Elizabeth Farrell became in charge of these special education classes as they were expanded in New York. School nurses, once again, children were out on the street because they were, uh, they had some kind of problem that wouldn't allow them to go to school. So in 2002, Wald pressured the school system to provide school nurses and succeeded in an experiment to have Lena Rogers, a Henry Street nurse, hired as New York City's first public school nurse. This was going to be an experiment and if it worked, they would hire more school nurses. Now, in her first month, Rogers treated 893 students made 137 home visits and helped 25 children who had received no previous medical attention recover and return to school. Shortly thereafter, the Board of Health hired its first fleet of 12 school nurses. In 1908, she encouraged the school district to have free lunches because she said it's a serious loss to the individual child to have free lunch kitchen associated with the school. His most precious gift if foreign born is the absence of class distinction in a public school, the stronghold of democracy. Ms. Walt was interested in having nursing become a profession and she persuaded Columbia University to appoint 
one of her nurses as the first professor of nursing in the country. And she started a program um, at the university school department of nursing and health. She started and she caused nursing education to shift away from solely hospital taught training to university, university courses augmented by hospital field work. So this was a big step forward at Teachers College in Columbia. At the same time here in Rochester, Susan B. Anthony was also recognizing that nurses would need a college education. <clears throat> Lillian Wald was a trade union activist very controversial. Here it is a woman whose uncles all in the clothing industry and in New York, she becomes a trade union activist. In this quote, she's saying that many people feel that women are still home and taking care of their children, but the people that she worked with were out working in factories and they needed to be treated fairly and get decent pay. And she becomes an advocate of the people in the neighborhood who are working in these uh, mostly clothing factories. She was also involved in dealing with strikers. And she says here, if there's a strike, try to discover both sides of the question, not rejoicing in the work working men's failure without understanding what was behind the discontent. While she's fighting for unions, those here in Rochester shut down their business because of unions. The United Garment Workers of America tried to in, and her uncles shut down their businesses and they went bankrupt. In 1911, in 1911 was the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in New York, and most of the women that were there had been uh, involved with the Henry Street Settlement. So um, this was a very tragic moment for the people at Henry Street, and especially for Miss Walls. <clears throat> 146 girls lost their life in this uh, terrible tragedy. In, uh, she was called she appeared everyone quieted down. They were in awe and um, the, re the newspaper report says everyone came and listened. Miss Wall didn't know anything about fire prevention. She was known as a person whose heart was always in the right place and was greatly respected because she was loved. <clears throat> One day when the nurses and other social workers were sitting around the breakfast table um, and reading the paper, there was a comment that the government had a department to deal with the nation's cotton crop. And they were having a problem with bull weevils. So it was said, government can have a department take such an interest in the nation's cotton crop. Why can't it have a bureau to look after the nation's crop of children? This was in 1903. And this became a very important initiative of the Henry Street Settlement. At that particular time, the, they wanted the Federal Children's Bureau to help with keeping families together because many children were put in orphanages, how to prevent, to help children when there were disasters like fires in the home, how to keep children out of factories and in school. And here you can see at the time that children were working in order to pay the rent for their parents. And this is a saying that is so important that Lillian says, 
uh, pretty relevant to us today. Reforms can only be accomplished when attitudes change. Here are children getting working papers, would drop out of school and go to work in factories or And here is Lily, uh, Lavinia Dock and Lillian Wald, a protesting child labor in unsafe conditions in uh, New York. Now, women's suffrage, Lillian, of course, was very interested in. However, many of her benefactors did not want her marching around. Uh, and uh, so she had to be very careful because she needed to have the money that they were giving her to run this operation. However, uh, many of her people were marching and there's in this picture, we see Lavinia Dock, the woman that has the staff. Uh, she was a leading person in suffrage. Uh, she eventually devoted her whole life to suffrage and she worked with Alice Paul and was one of the people that um, chained themselves to the White House fence and eventually was imprisoned. And, um, but while Lavinia and many other nurses were marching, Lillian was organizing the precincts in her neighborhood, the immigrants to prepare for the vote in, you know, in 1915, the New York State had a women's suffrage campaign and um, it failed in the legislature. And uh, in 1917, it occurred again, but this time Lillian was on top of it and she organized the neighborhoods and she went to, the, the nurses all would go out and talk about um, the importance of voting for women's suffrage. And I remember only the men could vote, so they'd have to have the husband's vote. And they would put out flyers like this. And finally in 1917, the campaign for women to vote was successful and a great deal of credit was given to Lillian for organizing the precincts where the uh, immigrants lived. I'm very interested in the Spanish influence epidemic as I'm sure you are as well and in 1918 Lillian was very involved in this and received a great, deal, a great many accolades for her work in New York City at this time. Now, this is what happened. Uh, when the flu was beginning to get close to New York City, we know it started in Boston and spread, the uh, Red Cross summoned relief organizations and finally requested that Lillian Wald chair a nurses emergency council. She agreed on the condition that all nursing agencies coordinate and work through Henry Street centers. They agreed. And the next morning, the Red Cross building became the headquarters and all the municipal and private agencies affiliated with social service groups, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, all agreed to Ms. Wald's plan. Immediately volunteers were solicited. And here you can see, uh, this flyer that was given out in front of these uh, stores in New York City, within a few, uh, within a less than a day, they had many, many uh, volunteers. Um, hundreds came to the office of Henry Street to volunteer. Everything moved quickly when Miss Wall was in charge, just for an example. Bellevue Hospital called her one morning and said that the laundry department people had walked out because there were many people coming in that were sick, they were afraid and they left. And so Bellevue Hospital was left with no laundry services. By 12 o'clock, it seems hard to believe in the days before we had cell phones, that the domestic science teachers from Teachers College and their students appeared at Bellevue and took over the laundry. That shows how efficient Lillian Wald was. So it was that the police, social agencies, tenement house inspectors, nurses, aides, and untrained volunteers were knit together in one group. Do we need her today? 
And what she did was she organized these people to give bedside care to the sick, two, to supply soup and custard and bedclothes and linens to people in need, number three, to furnish childcare and housekeeping services, and four, to run a motor service to all parts of New York City. And for this, she received a great many commendations. And this is one of her mottos, in times of need, act. She was always concerned about the treatments of African Americans and as a civil rights activist, she insisted that all Henry Street classes be racially integrated. She was one of the founders of the NAACP and the first major public conference opened with a meeting at the Henry Street settlement in 1909. This could have been a very controversial first meeting because there was a reluctance for people of different races to sit down at a dinner table together. And so when this was brought up to uh, Ms. Wald, like we can't have a dinner because it will be controversial who we sit next to. Lillian said, have no fear, come to Henry Street and we will have a buffet and everyone can eat standing up and then you don't have to worry who you're sitting next to. And everyone was thrilled with this solution. <laughs> okay. uh, of course, uh, Lillian was against any kind of war. She was an anti-militarist and um, she was very active in uh, her beliefs. Here is the Henry Street Settlement March on Peace. And um, now of course I'm a teacher of immigrants, so I'm so interested in her work with immigrants. And this is a quotation that I love and I want to share it with you. And she writes it in um, one of her two books, House on Henry Street or Windows on Henry Street. And uh, what precipitated this quote was that she was standing out in front of the Henry Street settlement and there are three public schools nearby. And she was standing there when the schools were letting the children out and looking at the children, she pondered their futures and wrote this. Out they pour the little hyphenated Americans more conscious of their patriotism than perhaps any other large group of children, unaware that to some of us, they carry on their shoulders our hopes of a finer, more democratic America, when their old world traditions shall be mingled with the best that lies in our new world ideals. They bring a hope that a better relationship, even the great brotherhood, is not impossible and that through living love and understanding, we shall come to know the shame of prejudice. Here she is describing in a time when there was a lot of prejudice against immigrants, she's writing good metal in our melting pot, always writing newspaper articles, talking about how fortunate we are to have these people. Now, during the war years, uh, Lillian's mother moved to the Henry Street Settlement. This is like 1917. This brought, brought great joy to uh, Lillian's life. Minnie Wald had lived in Rochester with her daughter, Julia, but moved a few years before Julia remarried and gave up her home in Rochester to move to New York City. He loved living at Henry Street Settlement. She taught embroidery and enjoyed telling stories to the young children. Jacob Reese met Lillian's mother for the first time at Henry Street. He reprimanded Lillian for never talking about her family. It never occurred to me, said, that you had a mother and a family. I thought you were just you and always had been, but your mother is a person too. 
Well, during this period, uh, Lillian rented a home in Westport for her mother to stay during the hot summer months. Lillian would visit on weekends. As a result of this good experience, Lillian bought a house surrounded by eight acres and a pond two miles from the center of town. She hired a gardener and had the house beautifully land on the pond. It was to this home that Lillian retired. This is where she greeted many visitors from all over the world. She researched animals in her pond and loved her garden. She enamored herself with the townspeople by installing lights on the pond so that young people could skate at night. This is where she wrote her second book called Windows on Henry Street. <clears throat> so many visitors came to Westport. Eleanor Roosevelt was a visitor and here she had uh, Helen Keller come and visit her. So it was quite exciting for the people at West Fort, Westport as well. They became very close friends uh, to Lillian. And upon her death at the age of 73 in 1940, uh, thousands filled Carnegie Hall to celebrate Wald's remarkable legacy and to hear messages from leaders, including uh, President Roosevelt, commending Lillian Wald's vision, compassion, and leadership. <clears throat> On Lillian Wald's headstone is the Far East inspired insignia that she had designed for the Henry Street settlement to signify we are all one family recognizing her universalist philosophy. Uh, she's buried in Mount Hope Cemetery here in Rochester. And you see that this uh, insignia is also on her tombstone where most people in the section that she's buried, which is a Jewish section, might have stars of David. She has instead, we are all, one family. This is the grave site of the family uh, at Mount Hope. On your left, you see uh, Lillian is next to her sister, Julia. Behind them is Minnie and um, Julia's parents, Julia and uh, Lillian's parents and their brother, Alfred. And um, on the right, you see her stone, which has since been cleaned. The flowers are planted by the local nurses who were part of the visiting nurse service here in Rochester. It now has a different name. And they come once a year and have a ceremony during nurses month there. Lillian during her, um, Lillian, always received many honors for the work she did. Uh, the New York Times named her as one of the 12 greatest living American women in 1922. And later she received the Lincoln Medallion as outstanding citizen of New York. In 1937, there was a radio broadcast to celebrate her work as well. She was in the Greater Americans Hall of Fame at, and at New York University. She was also in 1996 in the National Women's Hall of Fame in Seneca Falls. So she received many accolades during her days. In 2007, she was an honoree of the Jewish American Hall of Fame. And this is, these are just absolutely lovely um, medallions that were made in her honor. Uh, she would not have been terribly happy with this because she didn't like to be called a Jewish anything. Uh, she said, I will not be pigeonholed 
she scorned religious categories. She told a reporter for the New York Telegram in December 1930, people are fed or hungry, warm or cold, well or sick, happy or unhappy. These are the only classifications I know. The enduring lessons that we learn from the Henry Street Settlement then and now. Each of us is whole and worthy. Poverty is a social issue. It's not the fault of the people that happen to be poor. There is power in bridging differences. She's meaning people need to sit around the table and solve their problems and reach consensus. Neighbors matter and in times of need act. At the end of her second book, Windows on Henry Street, she talks about the whole movement being international at this point. She says, people rise and fall together. No one group or nation dare be an economic or social law under her unto itself. So in conclusion, oh, before, this is uh, the latest book uh, regarding Lillian Wald and Henry Street Settlement. It's two years ago, it was published. And what's unusual about this book is it not only talks so much about Lillian Wald and her work, but it shows how her work is being used today and her ideas today are operated in the Henry Street Settlement. For And so for the us who don't live in New York, this is a very valuable um, book. So in conclusion, never in all the years have we on Henry Street doubted the validity of our belief in the essential dignity of man and the obligations of each generation to do better for the oncoming generation. Lillian D. Wald, RN, Visiting Nurse Service of New York founder. So thank you very much. Now we can open up the to questions from the audience. I know we've actually got a lot of people with us today who um, are very knowledgeable about Lillian Wald themselves. I would like to you to encourage you to um, keep your comments focused on uh, what Pat has presented and in your questions at Pat. We also have um, Kathy from Westport and Katie from the Henry Street Settlement in the audience. So uh, they are welcome to answer questions as well if you have questions about Connecticut or New York City and Lillian's work there. Um, we do already have a couple of questions in the chat. Pat, so I would like to start with those. And Pat, let me read to you. First, did you learn anything about whether Lillian uh, addressed domestic vi violence during her work on Henry Street or elsewhere? I have not read a lot about her work with domestic violence. Maybe Katie can help us with that. I, I saw that um, question in the chat as well, and I have never read anything related to that topic. Unfortunately, I'm sure that's something that she she did care about and did work around, but I have I've never seen a reference to it in particular. Good, thank you. And the next question, um, the question comes from someone who says that she's a young lady with an interest in nursing. And she's wondering if there was still a stigma attached with nursing at the time that Lillian was working in the field and were her parents concerned? Absolutely, there was. Uh, it was scandalous to think that a woman of, from her social class would consider nursing, which was considered a very, uh, not terribly professional. It was more like being a servant. Uh, so I don't think her mother was too thrilled when she heard that uh, she wanted, she aspired to be a nurse. And uh, so, no, it was, and I'm sure that was a big discussion at the time. That things have changed, haven't they? Isn't it wonderful how things have changed? 
that is all of the questions in the chat. So at this point in time, um, you can feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask correct, uh, questions directly to Pat. And while we're waiting for you to do that, there is another question coming in on chat, a couple more questions coming in on chat. Feel free to continue to ask those. Um, Krista is, whoops, Krista is asking, what, if you could elaborate a little more on her connection to the Elwanger Berry family. Oh, yes. This is, this is amazing. Those of you that are not from Rochester, Elwanger Berry was one of our big uh, industries here in Rochester. That's why we're called the Flower City. Um, and they had nurseries that were famous all over the world. And Elwanger and Barry were two immigrants that came, Elwanger from Germany, Barry from Ireland. And they became partners in this very successful venture. And uh, Patrick Barry had a son named Charles Barry. And it was Charles Barry that married Lillian Wald's sister, Julia. Now you may say, well, that's interesting because we have a Jewish girl marrying a Catholic man, but uh, there was a very liberal kind of atmosphere going on at that time, especially among um, Reformed Jews, where it wasn't a big deal. Intermarriage was not such a big deal. This was so, uh, for Julia to marry into the Berry family was a very big leap, let me tell you. Uh, she had several children. One child died young, and then she had three children there, the Barry children. Um, Lillian is buried next to her sister, but her first husband and her children that are buried in Holy Sepulchre in our Catholic cemetery. Um, that's a little bit about Elwanger Barry. Certainly a good catch for Julia. And um, her mom wished that Lillian would also marry someone that was equally prestigious. Another question uh, Teresa is asking, did she work with Alice Hamilton? I don't know about that. I don't know, can't answer that question. And there's a question that I think is for me, which is how can we access the recorded session? This session will be posted to the Central or the Rochester Public Library's um, YouTube channel. And we will share that information on our face page, Facebook page when it's available as well. And I want to remind people too that many wonderful books have been written about Lillian Wald's life. Um, of course, she herself wrote two books, The House on Henry Street and windows on Henry Street. And in these books, she gives examples of the kind of people that she was working with. So it's a, a very exciting kind of uh, narrative about her life and what she learned in the years on Henry Street. Then many people have written uh, very professional books. Probably one of the most famous is uh, Marjorie Feld's book, called The Biography of Lillian Weld. And um, this is on a YouTube production. It's a lecture by Marjorie Feld where she talks all about um, Lillian Wald in early Rochester. And that happens to be on the YouTube channel from Westfall Library. So there's a connection there. Uh, but this book is an academic book. She's a professor at Babson College. And she gets into a lot of very deep ideas like assimilation, what Rochester was like, why this family would have been so liberal. It's a fascinating read. And this is one of the many books that are written about Lillian Walt. The comment in the chat, Pat, that you might find interesting, uh, Cynthia Houck is noting that her mother, who's now 98 years old, was one of the first licensed practical nurses hired by Rochester's visiting nurse service in 1946 when they introduced the concept of having both RNs and LPNs working together as visiting nurses. And she says that this approach was encouraged 
by Isabel Dill, who was the founding director of the Rochester School for Practical Nursing, which was then sponsored by the city school district. And I think, uh, I think Cynthia has a, uh, an addendum to that story. That's quite interesting. And that's all the questions I see in the chat. So is there anybody else who would like to ask a question in person? There are a lot of accolades for you in the chat, Pat. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Don't you wonder as a group how it would be if Lillian Wald were alive today and how she could really influence our lives if, you know, uh, for example, operating the whole um, Spanish influenza epidemic business in New York City the way she could organize things and get people to follow her. I'm amazed. Um, and how did you get um, involved in, in your research and your interest? Because your passion is, is really infectious. Well, um, I've been living with this woman, you know, for so many years. I'm a tour guide at Mount Hope Cemetery. And so for many years, I've, you know, been really thinking about Lillian Wald and reading more and more about her. And um, I usually start my tour by saying, who do you think is the most famous person in Mount Hope Cemetery? And people say, Susan B. Anthony or Frederick Douglass. And then I always challenge them and say, maybe it's Lillian Wald. And they go, what, are you kidding me? Um, but when you think about what she did in her lifetime, and here she is from Rochester. I mean, this is where she grew up. She came here when she was like five years old and was educated here. And um, yet she had this ability to, uh, to get people organized. And instead of being aggressive, she was able to get along with people and have them give her money. Uh, wow. It's amazing. So I've always been a fan of hers. And now I think other people in our organization that give tours also are fans of hers because I notice whenever we're over in that section, everyone wants to talk about Lillian Wald. So we're making an, you know, an impact. <laughs> we're also happy that Katie's here because we've established a great relationship with Henry Street. Um, This is one of the things that we use on our tours, which is a Henry Street Settlement kind of gimmick. It's very cute and it's um, telling the Henry Street Settlement that we're thinking of you, right, Katie? Yes, definitely. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. I really enjoyed learning more about her life in Rochester and more about her family. And Thank we've you. also heard and you'll have to correct us if I'm wrong, from some of her distant relatives that came to visit us at um, a presentation I did at the Brith Kodish. They said that if we Rochesterians go to Henry Street and we identify ourselves that you all will give us a tour and really <laughs> treat us like celebrities. Is that oh, true? Oh, of course, <laughs> yes. <laughs> After cool. after COVID, please come. Any any of you, I would love to give you a tour of Henry Street. So, um, I, I'll actually put my um, email address in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. I I work at Henry Street as the public historian, and also I do a lot of our work in our other programs as well as an ESL teacher and um, delivering meals and work on the COVID helpline as well. So. I just want to mention that we are still a, a very active social services organization in the present day and Lillian's ideas, philosophies, and legacy are alive and well at Henry Street. It's an organization that I'm really, really proud to work for. Her dream was that it would change and adjust to the times and you've done that at Henry Street, haven't you? Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a, a blueprint that was laid out by Lillian Wald to be, be able to respond and be flexible and have it still endure mm -hmm. 127 years later. So 
Well, we want to visit you. Yes, and I, I haven't been to her gravesite, so I really look forward to, to coming up. Well, we welcome you and the people from Westport too to come to Rochester and um, visit these places. Now, you know that at the beginning of my presentation, I didn't have too many interesting slides about her childhood. And that's because in 1899, her sister's home where all of her childhood stuff was burned to the ground. Mm -hmm. So we have no photographs or um, any school papers or um, anything from her childhood, which is too bad. Uh, there is a question in the chat about the video that you referred to, wondering if, if he, he has found the correct video. Um, the one that is by um, Marjorie Feld. Is that the one that they're referring to? I provided a link to the video. Okay. Uh, I'm pulling it up now to look at. Um, it's a talk at Temple Breath Kodesh. Oh, that's a that's one that I did. Uh, I think I, I referred to a, a YouTube uh, talk by Marjorie Feld, and the way that I got it was from uh, Westfall West um, Port Library, and through West Port Library, I got the link to the um, YouTube because they had done an exhibit on Lillian Wald. So um, yeah, she so this summer, uh, she was supposed to have come to Westport to lecture. But during COVID, we made it a virtual online one. And mm -hmm. there is a live link. Um, I can't send it to I'll try to get it from the chat uh, and put it in there or email it to you for uh, for later. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, we did an exhibition, um, it opened in February and closed in March due to COVID on uh, Westport suffragist. Um, and we named it uh, in, in honor of her and um, after R.L. Dufus's uh, book, um, Westport's Neighbors and Crusaders. Um, and because many of the uh, individuals in Westport um, who fought for suffrage that lived in Westport, some were also summer residents. Um, while she didn't support the Westport Equal Franchise League per se, um, she, we wanted to cite her in terms of her national role um, that she, that she is, and how she espoused um, suffrage. I mean, there were many, uh, she wrote letters to the editor about suffrage. She held events at Hunter Street Settlement for suffrage. Um, and like you said, she also, uh, you know, worked in the precincts um, and it, her, her work was admirable. Um, her, the town of Westport was uh, absolutely captivated by, by Lillian Wald and she loved them back. Um, I can only imagine the charisma that she had as a person throughout her life. Um, it's too bad we don't have her 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 audio voice because her voice um, comes so loud through her words and actions. Um, but she she was really remarkable. Um, for her 70th birthday, they created a birthday book, um, and all the uh, artists and writers and children of Westport um, contributed. Um, to this incredible uh, um, visual and, 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 and written tribute. Um, and it was actually talked about in the news across the country. It was so impactful. Mm -hmm. And you still have a copy of that, don't you? Um, that book? That the, people um, the book itself is in the collection of the Westport Museum of, and History and Culture. Um, and it was exhibited uh, maybe 10, 20 years ago. Um, the cover of the book um, or a, a prototype of the cover of the book um, just entered the collection of the Westport Library given um, by Ann Shepper. Mm -hmm. um, and her um, grandfather was Aaron Rabinowitz who was a member of the Heroes uh, American Heroes Program at, uh, at the um, Henry Street Settlement. And if it wasn't for his relationship with, with, uh, with Lillian Wald, who was really a mentor to him, 
he would not have come to Westport in the 1930s um, and had the philanthropic impact that he, the, that he and his family still does today. So it's a, there are all these little, you know, mm -hmm. seven degrees of separation and how she influenced and impacted people. We actually now have the guest book um, from Westport at, at Henry Street, on site at Henry Street. Um, it was, oh, it was given oh. to us about a year ago. Yeah. What, the birthday, the birthday book or the, the birthday book? book. The, oh, you have that? We have it. Oh. Yeah. Very recently, though. Oh, I need to get in touch with you then. Um, yeah. So um, it was yes, gifted I, to I, us. I, oh, okay. That's really great to know. Um, mm -hmm. But I'll give you images of the um, of the book cover. Um, and I, I'm also the town art curator um, in Westport, oh. so which is how I got into all of this um, because of through the the progressive artists. Um, but I'd really like to help document that. Um, and I, um, but I'll talk I'll get, I'll talk to you offline. That sounds great. Uh, more. That's really <laughs> wonderful to know it's there. That's great. We and can it's in look, safekeeping. We can see the picture online. There's some pictures of this um, booklet. But we can't see what's inside, so uh, I hope I'd love to see what people actually wrote. You know, uh, the cover is so intriguing. I I actually have a a, a, a facsimile and a, a um, and scans of those pages that um, mm -hmm. Anne Shepherd did uh, uh, about ten years ago. They're actually, I, but I can. We'll talk. <laughs> I'll talk, Katie. So that's Another so great thing to know. That, uh, is a sort of a Westfall connection. What? Why do I say Westfall? Okay, Westport. Westport, yeah. Is um, in her books there are all these illustrations of all kinds of things, and I just recently learned that they and this is her book Windows on Henry Street, which she wrote right. when she lived in Westport, that a local artist did all these drawings. Well, the, it, not just a local artist, a very important American artist, James Dougherty. Um, who was uh, who, who moved to Westport around 1923. Um, and yes, he illustrated that. He um, was a very important modernist painter um, who also was an illustrator um, and became a kind of coined as Jimmy the Ink <laughs> at one point. But he's a very, very important American artist um, who, who lived um, actually just over the line in, in Weston. Um, and he did that. Um, there's not a lot of documentation um, on that project with the James Dougherty Foundation. And I don't know where the original drawings are, but they are um, so, you know, they kept capture the, the spirit um, of, the, of the street and of the people. Uh, it, it's really an important um, contribution and, and connection to Westport and Lily Mall. Um, what is the story with her house now? Did it just, was it just sold to another family or what? Um, the house is standing. Uh, it's um, it's it's beautifully preserved. Uh, we recently had some local attention with it through the exhibition. Um, it's been plaqued, uh, so to speak, as a as her house, uh, um, and you can drive by it um, on the way to the beach, and it's right there. It's it's just really um, it's wonderful that it's been preserved with so many other homes in the area being being destroyed this one is is not and i think the current owners um, really cherish the heritage that it represents that's great good thank you so much for joining us we appreciate it oh it was great to, to be invited thank you i wouldn't have missed it <laughs> we have just a few minutes left if anyone else has any other questions And as Pat mentioned, she's been researching Lillian's sister who remained in Rochester. And so hopefully at some point we'll be able to hear from Pat about her as well. Uh -huh. so thank you all so much for joining us today. Oh, there's a, looks like uh, Reverend Schwartz, did you have a question? Go ahead and unmute yourself. I'm wondering about future talks. Is Amanda Bloomer buried in the Mount Hope Cemetery? No, I don't think so. Um, no. Now, we have 350,000 people buried there and I don't know them all, but I don't think she's one of them. Okay, sorry, thank you. <laughs> 
There is a question in the chat. Is the house on the pond listed in the National Register of Historic Places? I'm, I'm not certain if it is. I think it's in a historic district in Westport, but I can send you all um, some information um, on that. Uh, but I don't believe it's listed um, oh, on the National Register. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize my uh, my uh, microphone was muted because uh, my, my question was for Kathleen. My uh, partners, we moved my partner's parents here about six years ago from Westport and typical their house was sold for a fortune and was immediately torn down and a McMansion built. Is there, that's what seems to be the pattern in Westport. Is there any uh, way that the current owners or that your association could work to preserve uh, uh, Lillian's house so that it doesn't meet the demise of so many others in Westport. Um, our, our town actually has a chartered historic district commission and um, all demolitions are reviewed by that. Uh, and they also uh, receive a lot of public attention if, it were, if it's a historically significant house. Um, but as I said, I think this house um, uh, you know, is, is, it is preserved. Um, and I think the current owners, um, uh, do, do intend to keep it. I, I you know, I can't speak, um, uh, you know, on, on protections, uh, per se, but there is a process in Westport, um, for such review. And I think that if, uh, her house were to be, um, you know, subject to, to demolition in the future, I'm sure that the town would come around and rally around it, um, because of her legacy. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining us today. And, you know, as we mentioned, Pat is the president of the Friends of Mount Hope Cemetery. And I'm sure that once the weather gets warmer and once we have uh, passed the COVID pandemic, that Pat would be happy to lead tours that would take you to Lillian Wald's grave site. And uh, you can all learn more about her then as well. Thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you all again at our next Morning in the Morning presentation. These sessions are held on the second Saturday of, of the month. And you can register online at uh, rockcitylibrary.org. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Good. Thank you, Katie.